the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, as you probably know by now, it is Advent, which means that we are doing a lot of waiting. On one side, we're waiting for something we know already. We're waiting for the unfolding of a story we cherish. It's God choosing to come among us, to dwell among us, coming as a vulnerable little baby, born in a manger because there was no room for his poor parents in the inn. And we're waiting for the comfort and hope and joy and peace that we have found already in this story and in Christ's presence with us. But on the other side, we're waiting for something we don't know yet, for something that hasn't happened yet, and so we don't know when it will be or what it will be like. And that is the second coming of Christ, in power and great glory to judge the living and the dead. Now, I'm aware that talk of judgment may make some of us a bit squeamish. After all, we're rather familiar with how the whole idea of divine judgment can be twisted to justify human judgments and prejudices, or how it can be used to frighten people into church or some semblance of Christian faith. But remember that judgment is good news. It's the promise that God's kingdom will come here on earth. God's will will be done. Justice and peace will reign on earth, and we will know Christ's power and presence with us again in a way that is unlike anything we've known yet. It is good news, and so we wait both for Christ's first coming and for his second coming. And the fact is that we spend most of our lives in this in-between time that Advent makes plain to us, this in-between time between the hope and promises of Christ's first coming and his second. And the fact is that many of us spend a lot of time here spiritually as well, somewhere between the last time that we heard from Christ the last time that we felt inspired, beloved, chosen, assured of Christ's presence with us, and the next time, which hasn't happened yet, even though we needed it desperately, like yesterday. This is where we find ourselves. It's a waiting that is not easy, and it's not as much fun. It can be hard and scary. And this is the kind of waiting that Peter is talking about in our epistle this morning. He's talking to some of the earliest Christians, just a generation after Jesus walked on earth in the flesh and died and was resurrected and ascended. And just like us, they have known Christ already and been changed forever by his presence with them. And just like us, They can look around the world and in themselves and know that somehow his work is not quite finished. And so they're waiting for his return. Perhaps unlike many of us, they expected him to come any day, and definitely during their lifetime. So they wait and wait and wait. And 30 years go by and there's still no sign of him. And they start to wonder what all this is for. It doesn't help that other people are laughing at them, Peter tells us elsewhere in the letter, saying, where is this promise that you're waiting for? So they start to wonder, why are we doing this? What's it all for? How long will it be? Is Christ coming again at all? Should we just give up? Have we been kidding ourselves all along? No. No, Peter says, in so many words, no. Keep waiting, because it's in the waiting that you learn what faith is. It's in the waiting that you become the people you're called to be. Peter has some other things to say about this, thank goodness. He has some suggestions for how we can go about that waiting. First, he says, remember. 
Remember what you know already. Remember that Christ is with you already. Remember what you have known and experienced of him already. Remember the ways he has been there for you before and gotten you through things you never thought you could survive. Remember that his words are trustworthy and true. So if he says he's coming back, he means it. Second, Peter suggests, prepare. Prepare, not by taking extreme measures to shore yourself up against some potential future disaster or zombie apocalypse, but prepare by doing the work that is in front of you today. Prepare by practicing. Practicing living into your convictions. Practicing being the people you're called to be. Practicing being faithful. Now, and aside from Peter, I'd like to add that rituals can be a real help in this waiting and in this practicing. Rituals can be a lifeline, in fact. They help us show up. They help us show up for worship and prayer and relationship, even when we don't feel like it. They help us do faith, even when we don't understand it. And they help us wait. They help us stay present until, until the inspiration returns, the love returns, the presence of Christ that we can't deny returns, and we find ourselves changed. We find that something in us or between us has changed, that our relationship or our faith has grown and gone deeper. Third, Peter says, along with John the Baptist and a host of others, repent. Repent, remember, just means turn around. It means return. Return, Peter says. Return to the people you ought to be now. Return to the lives you're called to live now, here, today. Return to this life and your responsibility in it because you don't have forever. And what you do on this day matters a lot. That is, in fact, the message of judgment anyway. Return. Return to this life, return to yourselves, and perhaps most important, return to God. Because as much as we may lament our waiting and how long it goes on, Peter reminds us that God is waiting too. God has been waiting far longer than any of us can imagine. God has been waiting for us to wake up and return to God. That's what judgment is for, and that's what this delay is for. And so while we may sit there and be asking ourselves, can we trust God? Will God be faithful? Will Christ show up? Will Christ return? Perhaps. The better question for us today is, will we? Will we be faithful? Will we show up? Will we wait? Amen.